So welcome everyone to the webinar, Leaf Spots, Scorches and Wilts Affecting Southeastern U.S. Deciduous Trees. My name is Holly Campbell and I'll be the host for the webinar today. I'm an Extension Associate with Southern Regional Extension Forestry, working in urban forestry and wildland fire education and outreach. As part of the cooperative, cooperative extension system, our office develops educational products and resources to support forestry and natural resource programs across the southern U.S. region, like this webinar today. Our website is sref.info if you'd like to learn more about what we do, and that, that URL is in the top right corner of this slide. Our presenter today is Dr. Jean Williams Woodward from the University of Georgia. Before formally introducing Dr. Williams Woodward, I'll provide a short introduction. First of all, I'd like to thank the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension for co-hosting our Zoom webinar today. Today's webinar is part of a larger series entitled Understanding Urban and Community Forests and Extension Webinar Series. This series was planned by Southern Regional Extension Forestry with input from several Cooperative Extension Urban and Community Forestry experts in the Southern region. This slide includes the planning partners for the series. Their input on key topics and speakers for the series was essential, so we really appreciate their assistance in developing the series. The series is designed for educators, specifically Cooperative Extension County educators. However, each webinar in the series may also be relevant to natural resource managers, other types of educators, arborists, urban foresters, and more. So regardless of your work focus, all are welcome to join today's webinar and any webinar, webinars in the series. The goal of the series, which includes 12 webinars in all, is two-part, to increase extension educators' knowledge of research-based urban and community forestry information, and two, to provide educational resources that support delivery of that information to the public. Ultimately, the series aims to increase extension's role in urban and community forestry education and outreach. We're really hoping the series will reach not only extension personnel focused on horticulture, urban forestry, and natural resources, but also extension involved in family and consumer sciences, in youth education, and other focus areas where appropriate. So this slide includes some of the other webinars in the series. I couldn't fit them all on the slide, so there were 12. One was postponed, the um, July 24th one. Um, and so as you will note, today is the last webinar in our series. And uh, we're excited that we've had this opportunity to, to have all of these webinars this year. So you can access recordings of all of the webinars at sref.info or www.forestrywebinars.net. And I wanted to mention that the CEUs that are offered for each webinar are valid up to a year after the live webinar date. So you can still go back and watch these. For those of you who are not familiar with the Cooperative Extension, the Smith-Lever Act formalized extension in 1914, establishing the U.S. Department of Agriculture's partnership with land-grant universities to apply research and provide non-formal agricultural education. Congress created the extension system to address rural, rural <laughs> agricultural issues. Today, however, extension has expanded its focus to match changes in society and economics providing research-based education in areas like family and consumer sciences, forestry and natural resources, youth education, and so much more. Popular extension programs include 4-H and the Master Gardener program. Extension is a trusted information resource in communities, and for those of you who are not part of Extension, we make excellent partners to help disseminate information to the public. So please keep Extension in mind as a potential partner on your next urban and community forestry project. Though several extension educators provide urban and community forestry information to their communities, the number of educators in this area are few in extension. Our hope is that these webinars help increase extension's role in urban and community forestry education and outreach. There are likely several participants listening to this webinar who are unfamiliar with the, some of the numerous benefits of urban trees and forests. Urban trees and forests help clean our water and air. They reduce hot summer temperatures, wind speed, and noise. They've been shown to reduce crime and provide a sense of place and connection, beauty, and food. They also reduce our energy bills and increase our property value. And as Dr. Williams Woodward will share momentarily, urban trees continue to provide these benefits when we know how to properly care for them. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jean Williams Woodward. 
Dr. Jean Williams Woodward is an associate professor and extension plant pathologist at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Dr. Williams Woodward received her BS and MS degrees from the University of Wyoming and her PhD in plant pathology from the University of Minnesota. At UGA, she works closely with the UGA Plant Disease Clinic and is responsible for developing plant disease identification and management programs for ornamental plants and commercial greenhouses, nurseries and landscapes, urban and commercial forestry, Christmas trees and legume forages. She also teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on diagnosis of plant diseases, clinical plant pathology and ornamental pest management. So with that, uh, Dr. Williams Woodward, I'm gonna hand the reins over to you. I will stop sharing my screen and you can begin sharing yours. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes, that looks great. All right. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending today. I am going to talk about, as Holly mentioned, about the leaf spots, um, scorches, and wilts uh, affecting these southeastern deciduous trees. Uh, just to start out, um, there are many different fungi that actually cause leaf spots and blights on deciduous trees. There's, a, almost, there's too many to name, and almost every plant has their own specific fungus that can cause a problem. Oftentimes, leaves uh, may have actually two or more uh, diseases or insect problems at the same time, which can confuse diagnosis. And I just wanted to show this one example here of the um, of the leaf here on the right that actually has uh, um, I was trying to get, oh sorry, um, the leaf here on the right that actually has um, showing anthracnose, which is some of these smaller. I'm hoping you can see the, um, me point, using the pointer on my mouse, but it has some of the smaller. We can see it, it looks great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it has the, some of these smaller spots that are actually on this leaf, especially concentrated around the leaf veins, is really an anthracnose on this oak um, leaf. There's another leaf spot though called Tubakia leaf spot, which I'll talk about later, um, is actually these larger blotchy uh, kind of areas around the leaf tip and some of these larger kind of patches here on the leaf. So sometimes you actually get multiple different spots or different diseases on the same plants. Um, there, if you, you compound it even more when you start throwing in some of the insect galls and some of the insect feeding uh, damage on the, on the trees. I apologize for that. Um, like I mentioned, there's almost every plant has um, a leaf spot pathogen that's on there. I've just given you a couple examples here. Um, there's actually, this is a discula on a birch. Um, it's one of the diseases that will actually cause a lot of leaf drop. And so that your birch trees later in the fall or in the late summer will actually look almost completely bare with just like tufts of green leaves on the ends of the branches. There's a Cercospora leaf spot that's on a crepe myrtle that's actually become a major problem for us in the southeast. Uh, the, it actually causes a lot of uh, leaf defoliation and many of the crepe myrtles will lose all their leaves very prematurely. And their um, cultivars or different crepe myrtle cultivars actually vary in their susceptibility to this disease as well. Um, this is just another leaf spot on a pseudocercospora on a red bud, and then another example of a tar spot on maple tree. Most of these leaf spots are, are aesthetic problems. They usually rarely cause significant damage on established trees. So those established landscape trees, these are ones that have been there for years. They're often very large. Those trees can actually withstand quite a bit of leaf drop without actually impacting their health at all. The only time I really worry about a lot of leaf drop is on newly established trees of those ones that are recently transplanted because those trees need those leaves on that tree to be able to photos photosynthesize and develop carbohydrate reserves within the roots and try to build those root systems. But on larger established trees, Leaf spot diseases are for the most part an aesthetic problem. They're not gonna cause significant harm. Although if you're dealing with homeowners um, or landscaper or um, um, land managers who see a lot of leaf drop, it can be very concerning at times. And what, 
that brings me to the disease I want to talk about first is really some of these um, what we call anthracnose diseases. Um, anthracnose is a general term used for early spring leaf spot diseases. They cause very small leaf spotting like in the previous picture where I showed you on the oak as well as these larger kind of leaf blights and I'll show you some more pictures of that. Some of the anthracnose fungi actually will cause stem cankers, um, stem or branch cankers, and that's actually where the fungus will survive. Um, very few of uh, the leaf, the anthracnose fungi causing fungi are going to cause significant damage to the tree. An exception is really dogwood anthracnose. And I forgot to mention that there are many different species of fungi that cause anthracnose. Like I mentioned, anthracnose is just a generalized term for these diseases. But there is uh, many different fungi that cause anthracnose diseases. And I mentioned a few, a few here of Discula and the Colototrigum and the Apigonomia. Um, which I butchered that pronunciation, I know. Um, but the pictures here that I've shown are actually dogwood anthracnose. And dogwood anthracnose um, is caused by a, disc, by a fungus called Discula destructa. It's, um, it causes these uh, leaf spots that are often irregular in shape. They have a tan center with a very dark kind of purplish brown border to the outside. Uh, they can be concentrated around some of the leaf veins, like in this picture here. Um, this is one that years ago actually caused major concern uh, because we thought most of the dogwoods were actually going to die from this disease. And the reason they would die is because the other part of this disease is that it creates these canker uh, kind of um, branch and trunk cankers and also this shoot dieback. So you can see this picture trying to get my mouse to work. You can see this in this picture, you've got a canker that's developed because of the discula infection. And often you get a lot of epicormic shoots developing associated with those cankers as the tree basically is trying to survive and it puts out a lot of the epicormic shoots. But the problem is, is those epicormic shoots are being very, um, they're tender succulent tissues. When they first come out, they actually are very susceptible to infection and they get a lot of dieback. And because of the dieback, they also produce a lot of spores that can then splash to a lot of our foliage causing our leaf spots. But this canker will eventually girdle that um, tree and, and it can kill it. So as mentioned almost decades ago that we thought dogwoods were just going to all die because of this disease. But there are breeding efforts that have been in place that actually have bred um, dogwood anthracnose resistant dogwoods. And so most of the plants that we get through our tree nurseries are in, in actuality actually um, resistant to the disease. Um, and so we rarely see this disease showing up in landscapes anymore, but we still will find it showing up in the mountains. And if people actually would go and dig dogwoods from um, forests and try to transplant them, often you can introduce dogwood anthracnose into the landscape that way. But for the most part, the named varieties of dogwoods that are um, available to the nursery trade and to um, landscapers, those have some level of dogwood anthracnose resistance um, in them. There are many other common anthracnose diseases. So I just wanted to show a few pictures. There's like an oak anthracnose um, up here in the upper left-hand side. This is an oak anthracnose on a live oak um, that actually looked very similar to what we thought might be some, um, some leaf scorch as well. Uh, there's, this is ash anthracnose on the bottom uh, left right-hand side. And then even a picture showing some of the sycamore anthracnose where the anthracnose is developing along those veins. And that's a typical symptom of the sycamore anthracnose. I mentioned that leaf spots or anthracnose diseases can often cause significant leaf drop, especially if they happen if it's a very wet, warm kind of spring. And ash anthracnose is one of those where you can get very significant large amounts of leaves dropping off the trees and they'll drop while the leaves are green. And it can be very disconcerting for um, a homeowner or a land, land manager when they see that. But for the most part, it's not gonna significantly affect the health of the tree. Often the trees are going to flush out again and put on another set of leaves because that early leaf seed, that early leaf drop, it does happen in the spring. The trees will put out another flush of leaves. And then because the environment is generally different at that time, it might be hotter and drier, the anthracnose doesn't affect those new leaves. So we get 
early spring infection when we have wet, warm kind of conditions, and then um, you get, might get leaf drop, but a second flush of leaves will come out, and often these anthracnose diseases are not a problem on that second flush. Wanted to mention, I mentioned about the branch can or about the trunk canker with the dogwood anthracnose. Anthracnose pathogens actually ca can cause stem cankers. And one of the examples is sycamore anthracnose, where you actually get um, death of the leader each year of that branch leader. And so this picture in the upper right hand side is showing that death of that branch leader, where you ended up with an um, axillary bud developing, and so you end up with this crooked kind of branch, almost stair-stepping um, branch structure to it, to the tree. And so in the picture on the left-hand side, you can see this kind of crooked, almost trunk and kind of branches coming up. And that's a factor of the, of the um, anthracnose disease killing that initial leader, and now other buds are developing that are heading off in another direction. This um, the fungus actually survives in and on these uh, damaged tissue, the, where the cankered areas are, and that's where the pathogen survives. And so in the early spring, when you have a lot of rain, the uh, spores are then water splashed to any of the expanding leaves that are developing in the spring. And in this picture, you can see some of those developing leaves that are coming out, and many of them are blighted as well. Um, and so this was a sort of a severe case of that anthracnose disease. I did want to mention about um, landscape sanitation. Most of the time when we're talking about a lot of this leaf drop that happens and we think of see all these leaves with all these spots on it, one of the recommendations is really to rake and remove those leaves. And this is just a picture of a rose plant because I had one of this and showing a lot of, a lot of the leaf drop that happens with some of the fungal leaf spot diseases that gets on rose. If it is a plant that is very close to the soil surface, um, you can rake and remove these leaves and actually get rid of a lot of your inoculum or that part of the pathogen that's going to cause disease. You can get rid of that by raking it, removing it from the area, so therefore if no more raindrops or irrigation water is going to hit those leaves and pop spores back onto the lower leaves or the low, or lower branches of those plants. However, we tell people even with larger trees to rake and remove those leaves to help reduce disease spread. And it's something that Extension has been telling people for years, um, and I don't want to burst any bubbles, but the reality is, is that the fallen leaf litter on the ground underneath an oak tree or an ash tree is really not contributing that much to reinfection of that plant the following year. Um, so we tell people to rake and remove the leaves, oftentimes because we, um, don't want to be the person who tells a homeowner or a land manager that there's nothing you can do about a disease. So if you tell them to rake and remove it, they're at least doing something and it makes people feel better to do it. But as far as really contributing to leaf uh, or to disease reduction, on a larger landscape tree where there is a great distance between the ground and those lower branches, those leaves are really not contributing that much. The infection is really occurring from all the little tip dieback that may be occurring in the branches from the anthracnose um, fungi. So um, I probably will get calls about that one. Um, one of the other, um, just to kind of move on to some other little leaf spot diseases that you may see, um, and I forgot to put the pathogen in here, but um, I just realized that. But this is oak leaf blister. And, um, Oak leaf blister is an early spring disease that occurs and, and affects at bud break. It's common on almost all oak species, and in some cases, under severe infection, you can get a lot of leaf drop. But oftentimes, the leaves stay on the on the attached to the tree. What people end up seeing is like this picture that's here on the right hand or the left hand side is they see all these um, light green kind of raised, almost bubbling kind of uh, spots that develop on those leaves. Those, uh, the infection actually is the pathogens on the underside of the leaf and it causes this cupping of the leaf and that's where it gets that blister kind of name to it. Initially the spots are green and then eventually they'll turn brown like in the picture on the right hand side. And so often people might confuse this with being more of like an anthracnose disease when in fact it's actually just oak leaf, old oak leaf blister. The oak leaf, um, what 
the inf I mentioned the infection happens at bud break, and often people don't know they have this problem until they see these symptoms develop. And this will be a recurring theme for the next couple of few slides about symptom development, is that once you see these symptoms and these leaf spots developing on these leaves, it's actually too late to apply any kind of fungicides that might try to reduce or prevent the infection. I've actually had a landscaper tell me one time that my fungicide recommendation didn't work because the leaf spots were still there after they sprayed the product. And the reality is the leaf spots are there because that fungus is actually killing that tissue. And if they've killed the tissue and that's how they're surviving is on the dead tissue as necrotrophs, no matter what you apply to that leaf, it's never going to turn that leaf green again because dead tissue doesn't come back to life. So hopefully you all know that. Um, so when, when we're trying to control for a lot of these diseases, we really have to apply products preventatively. And in most cases, they're not needed. Or in this case with the oak leaf blister, oftentimes you miss the time, the, the um, critical infection period, when this pathogen is actually infecting those, those newly developing buds at bud break. And if you wait beyond that time period, you've already missed um, infection. Another leaf spot I wanted to mention was um, Tabachia leaf spot. And Tabachia, which used to be called Actinopelti, so some websites and things you'll still find it referred to as Actinopelti. There are actually several new species of this pathogen um, that have been described in recent years, and some of them as, as recently as 2017. They tend to cause um, leaf spotting and blighting in sort of our mid to late summer um, time period. The initially, uh, when I would see actinip or this uh, Tubachia leaf spot, I often thought of it as being more of an aesthetic problem, uh, that it was really something coming in on drought or heat stress leaves, especially here in the southeast. But you can get significant and kind of severe defoliation with this pathogen. And there was actually a new uh, species called Tubachia iwanensis that was uh, identified a few years ago that causes severe dieback on, actually, on bur oak in the Midwest. And as the name, the species name designates, it was actually first found in Iowa. And in some cases, it was reported as actually killing the trees because the, if the uh, dieback and the um, leaf drop was so significant, especially if it happens year after year, uh, we have this problem. There are like I mentioned, there are many different new species that have actually been described, and we do not know enough about this. Um, I think it's something, an area that does need some additional research and looking at, because I'm seeing the, this uh, Tubachia leaf spot more and more on samples that are submitted to our plant disease clinics. Uh, the picture here on the right-hand side is actually a burr oak um, that was taken by um, uh, Andrew Lloyd uh, with um, Bartlett Tree. But you can see the dieback that's actually occurring in the lower branches, and so in some cases, entire leaves are turning brown. Um, in other cases, you're just getting some leaf spots developing. But this kind of pattern of it being on the lower portion of the plant, and most of these leaf spots will develop on the lower portion of the plant and then move upward as they move through the canopy, it's usually because there's um, the there's lower leaves stay wetter. In some landscape situations, those lower leaves may be hit by um, lawn irrigation or sprinkler irrigation. So they tend to stay wetter and they tend to have, the, more, the longer those leaves stay wet, the more disease problems they're gonna have. To show you a couple other examples of this Tabachia leaf spot, the symptoms we see with Tabachia is that it can cause often sometimes very distinct leaf spots to actually blighting along the veins or almost showing sort of this scorch type of symptom. So on this oak here, this you can see these individual spots that are developing, but you also see these larger blighted out areas that can look a lot like almost drought stress later in the season. Okay? And that's what I used to always attribute it to, is that we just thought it was high temperatures, drought stress, actinopelti showing up, and that still could be true, but we are seeing a lot more of these spots and, um, and infection happening on our trees. 
this is a uh, actinopelty here, or I call it actinopelty and I apologize, um, I'm old, but uh, it's actually Tubachia. And this is the Tubachia on a sawtooth oak. And you can see it looks more like a scorching around the outside edges of the leaf. Okay. And in this case, this was a picture of that bur oak, um, just up close picture of the bur oak from the previous slide, where you can see these blighted areas, but you can also see these very small little discrete spots. Um, there is a lot of yellowing associated with this um, on, on this bur oak here in this sample, but you can also see the blighting that's occurring just along the veins. And that's also very common because a lot of our, our fungi need to have water in order to infect and um, to, um, for the fungal spores to germinate and to infect. And so a lot of times these things are concentrated along some of the veins because that's where the water is going to accumulate inside that on that leaf. Another tabaki leaf spot I wanted to show you, which was actually something that was new for me, and that sample that we just received over the last two weeks um, here in our Georgia Plant Disease Clinic. But this is a tabaki leaf spot on a southern sugar maple. And you can see the individual little small discrete spots, but also these larger blighted out areas. Uh, the spot itself looks like this over on the left hand side, where you can see these little black kind of dots kind of uh, areas in here, that's actually the fungus that's there. And that's what's being shown here in this um, more magnified view is these black dots actually are these sort of pseudothesia of the, of, um, or of, uh, of the tubachia. And this fungus actually produces, um, it has, it produces its uh, spores with inside a structure that looks like a shield. And it just sits on top of the leaf and is attached with a very small stalk. And so if you were to touch these things, they would pop off. And if you pop off, often people think they're an insect that has just jumped from the leaf. But it truly is this fungal pathogen that we need to look at some more. Another leaf spot disease that um, I'm seeing more often is a fungus called Cristulariella. Um, the Cristulariella is, it can infect maples, um, sassafras, eucalyptus, and oak, uh, at least on the ones I've seen it here. I believe I had a colleague who told me they found it also on crepe myrtle. Uh, it causes leaf spotting to almost whole leaf blighting, but the symptoms that we tend to get with this uh, Crystallaria kind of leaf spot is that the leaf spots have what called like a zonate or target-like appearance. And you can see them here on this red maple where you've got these spots that you can see this almost target bullseye effect on the spot. In this picture here, this was sent in um, from a, by a county agent, and so, uh, or Georgia county agent, and you could see these uh, individual spots, but also these larger blighted out areas until eventually it's almost coalescing and causing these extreme large areas that are blighted. This pathogen, once it starts getting into this very severe blighting and like in these pictures here on the right hand side, it will cause significant defoliation and it will drop those leaves actually when the leaves are still green. So people can be very, again, very concerned because all of a sudden their trees just look like they've just dropped every leaf um, prior to the prematurely. So they, they never turn up, they never turn their uh, fall colors, they just drop when they're green. And the last leaf spot disease I wanted to show you was, um, this is a shot hole leaf spot disease on ornamental cherry. And on this case of the cherry trees, we are seeing a lot more of this leaf spot disease developing on them where the leaves will turn, um, they will get small spots, and I have a picture of this in the next slide, but they'll get very small circular spots and the, cir the center of the spots will actually drop out. And that's where this shot hole uh, symptom comes from or the shot hole name comes from. But one of the things we notice on the trees is that they get a lot of leaf yellowing because that's where this infection is. But also you get this tree that starts thinning out. In some cases, the entire tree can defoliate. And I've had cases where people have co contacted me telling me that their cherry trees are dead and it'll be midsummer. And in some cases, their cherry trees truly are dead, 
but in most cases, it's usually because of this fungal leaf spot disease. This kind of repeated defoliation year after year after year will end up killing those trees. Um, so it's rapid defoliation over time um, or from over a number of consecutive years that can end up causing, if not killing it, severely stunting or severely kind of affecting the growth of those trees over time. These are just some of the symptoms that we're seeing um, on the, for the shot hole. You can often get the leaf yellowing. You can see the spots developing within there uh, on the leaf. You can also see in this picture on the right-hand side where the leaves, the leaf spots are these brown spots. The um, spot you can, is um, drops out and gives it that shot hole appearance um, that's there. Like I mentioned, you will get a lot of leaf defoliation as well, especially once those leaves turn yellow because they're no longer contributing or photosynthesizing um, and contributing to the, to the plant. Talked a lot about some of these fungal leaf spots or just showed you some of the more common ones and ones that I'm more concerned about at this time. But um, in general, when we're looking at sort of our fungal leaf spot disease management, the biggest thing I can tell people is know your plants and know what diseases they get. There's many extension resources that actually will list different um, diseases of. I know I even have a key to oak diseases in the landscape uh, that's available through our, our UGA extension um, publications website. But know the plants you have and what diseases they have and also when they actually occur. There are, the other thing is to keep the plant foliage as dry as possible. If there are many times, like I mentioned, a lot of the leaf spot diseases are usually on the lower portion of the plant canopy. And often that's because they may either be hit by irrigation, um, sprinkler type irrigation, or it's just wetter. Those leaves, there's less air circulation at that area. So the plants stay wetter for a longer period of time. Okay. The other question I get all the time is basically whether to spray or not to spray. This is, um, it can be a tricky and kind of difficult decision to make. One of the reasons why it's difficult is that it's often very difficult to spray larger established trees. It is incredibly difficult to actually spray, you know, a 40 foot oak tree. Um, it's off the, you are never probably going to get every leaf to protect it. So the type of control you get is very minimal and it's really not needed because many of these problems, like I mentioned, they're aesthetic problems. They're not going to significantly damage the health of the tree. So I don't think it is needed. When I do think fungicides might actually be helpful is really on those um, newly transplanted trees, young established trees, plants that um, just need to keep their foliage so that, the, again, they can photosynthesize and get carbohydrates down into their root systems. You want to apply your fungicides. Um, you're applying them prior to disease developing. So you're really looking for early symptom development. Oftentimes, you may miss it one year, but keep a record of it so that you know when it may show up again. And this is both for nurseries as well as in landscapes because these things recur almost every year. Um, fungicides like met, um, applied after leaf spots develop have real no effect on that pathogen on that plant on that or on that leaf on that plant. As I mentioned, most of these uh, pathogens, they are um, necrotrophs. They're basically killing the tissue in advance, um, as, after they infect, and they're producing their spores off of those dead portions of that leaf. And so applying a fungicide after you see leaf spot development is often too late. If you apply fungicides after the symptoms are there, it really is only to protect new growth. Um, and only if new growth is present or it's going to develop would I recommend doing that. In nurseries, it can be, um, we oftentimes get a second flush of growth developing late in the season. And because we have these warm days and cool nighttime temperatures and a lot of humidity, we get a lot more leaf spot problems. And so that's when you would actually target your applications. And it's just to maintain leaf development a little bit longer into the season. Um, applying fungicides on a plant that is a, like a deciduous tree 
after, especially after you start seeing symptom development and when there is no new growth that is going to occur is futile. There's no reason to do it. You will lose some, um, your leaves prematurely, but it's not going to affect the health of the tree. Um, I want to show you a couple things of just references for you. As I mentioned, I get a lot of calls and contacts about like what products to, to use for a lot of our ornamental plant diseases. There is um, this one, uh, we've created this ornamental fungacy efficacy table. It, this is the website where it, it, you can find it. It's through a group that we call ourselves SNPM. It's the Southern Nursery IPM uh, Working Group. And through this website, you can find this table. Um, we're updating it and um, we'll be adding some more uh, information into the table as well for the 2000, um, going into 2019, I think is when it will be up. But that will be at the same site as well. Okay. So this table actually lists all the different fungicides that are labeled for use on ornamentals and trees. We also list some of the different diseases that the, um, that these fungicides are labeled for, and then we rate them as being whether they're poor to um, good to I think excellent in some cases, um, to as well as their efficacy on that particular pet, um, disease. So it's something you might be able to use to help you decide on if you are gonna apply any kind of fungicides, which ones might actually be the best ones for you. The other thing I wanted to mention is we do have a regional pest control guide for ornamentals. This is um, also available. And I mentioned the SNPM, the Southern Nursery IPM Working Group. We have a website. Um, this is available uh, for the Southeast. It's a regional guide. Um, there are each individual states or some individual states may also have their own, uh, either a chemical manual or a pest management manual. I know Georgia has our own as well, but this is a regional one specifically for ornamentals that you can download um, different parts of it from this website as well. Okay. This also will, the plan is to update this again also in 2019. Okay. I do wanna, um, mention uh, or to move on from the leaf spots and actually talk about some of the wilts and some of the other diseases. One of the ones I mentioned was about oak wilt. And this is a tree, the, I think it's a pin oak, that's actually showing oak wilt symptoms where the whole tree is affected by this disease and it's being killed by oak wilt. The one thing I wanna mention about oak wilt distribution within the United States um, are all the states that are listed here in green. I'm here in Georgia and you can see there is no, um, we have never identified oak wilt here in the state. Um, if you break this down by a county level and just looking at the south southeast, so the border of Tennessee and Virginia is right up here. You can see Georgia's line, um, is right here, Alabama, and then also um, Mississippi and Louisiana moving further west. We have had oak wilt identified within like South Carolina and a few counties that are here. They are adjacent to a lot of our Georgia counties. There's been oak wilt that's been identified in Tennessee right adjacent to um, Alabama as well. Um, oak wilt is something that does occur we have, or it occurs in some of these southeastern states. As I mentioned, we just have never seen it happening here in, um, or we've never confirmed it here in Georgia and some of the other southeastern states. I do want to show you what it, um, information about oak wilt though, because this is something that I'm actually interested in trying to find out some more about it. But the oak wilt is actually caused by a fungus. Um, it, they've changed the name as of 2017, that it's um, Brettsiella um, is the new genus for it. It was formerly Ceratocystis. It is vectored by a bark beetle. Um, white oak or oaks in the white oak group are moderately susceptible to some are being tolerant. What you may see with some of the white oaks is more of a branch by branch dieback. Um, Red oaks, however, are very susceptible and they can die within a few months to a year after becoming infected. Unfortunately, for a lot of our tree diseases, there is no good control. So one of the controls is to use an injection of fungicides. The fungicide propiconazole, which is in the product Alamo, 
can be injected into the root flares and it can slow the progression of oak wilt, but it will not eliminate it. Um, often, and even the research that was done was that if you saw greater than 5% symptom development, so 5% dieback from oak wilt, um, which is a very small part portion of that canopy. It would basically be one small branch tip in, a, in an entire canopy of a tree. But if you saw greater than 5% symptom development, these fungicides were not going to be very effective at all. So it is something if you think you may have oak wilt, it's something I would suggest getting it to a plant disease clinic within your state and trying to see if it or a sample to that plant disease disease clinic in your state. So hopefully we can try to identify if that is the problem. Some of the symptoms, i just show you the picture here. This is from Iowa um, uh, State Plant or Iowa Plant Disease Clinic. This is a red oak here showing some of the dieback and the scorching, kind of a symptom you would see um, with the oak wilt. One of the things about oak wilt is that it does spread through the bark beetles as well as also through root grafts. And so what you tend to find are large patches of oaks dying out in an area because those beetles will move from plant tree to tree or if those plants are in the same um, close proximity to each other, you could develop root grafts that would allow that pathogen to spread through the root graft and into that next tree. It is a vascular disease and you get a wilting. And so if you were to cut through the stem, you would actually see these, um, this discoloration, uh, dark kind of brownish to greenish kind of discoloration um, inside in that vascular tissue. Okay. To see this though, typically the branch size needs to be at least maybe about the size of a quarter of an inch, um, very small branch tips, we can't find anything in or very hard time finding some of these things in. If you're doing trunk injection or, or uh, root flare injections with the Alamo, it does require actually usually pressurized um, injection of the chemical, the fungicide into it. There are ones that are canisters as well that can be used. So this kind of picture is, is getting very dated. Uh, however, since I told you that I, we've never received or have never confirmed oak wilt actually in Georgia, and I don't know how well it would actually survive in our state. We get very hot, we get very humid, and I don't believe that pathogen is going to survive as well. What we tend to get samples in that people say, I think of this as oak wilt, is more of what is bacterial leaf scorch. And bacterial leaf scorch is becoming a major problem for us um, in the southeast because we're seeing it on numerous tree species as well as um, entire towns and cities and roads can be infected by this. The one thing I want to show you the difference of is that when you think something is actually bacterial leaf scorch, if you look at these oak leaves, you can see this yellow banding that's developing behind where the scorching is, um, is coming back from the leaf tip. So that yellow band, and sometimes it might be a reddish band, uh, distinguishes it from oak wilt. So if I flip back to this previous picture where you can see oak wilt on the, on the oak leaves, you're basically going from brown directly into green. And you don't tend to see that yellow banding pattern. The leaves may turn yellow with the oak wilt, but you tend not to see this kind of, this yellow halo along between the scorching area and the green tissue. So I'm hoping that makes a little sense, okay. Um, we are looking at bacterial leaf scorch. Um, the uh, bacterial leaf scorch is caused by this xylem limited bacterium, xylella fastidiosa. Um, Xylella uh, fastidiosa, that, that bacterium, actually causes quite a few different diseases. Um, so if people have grown, um, may be familiar with it on Pierce's disease on like grapes, but it's also causing a, a bacterial leaf scorch on blueberries as well here in the southeast. However, there are different strains of the bacterium that affect the various different agronomic crops. So not all Xylella is exactly the same. It is spread by the feeding by several um, species of leafhoppers or sharpshooters. These are just two um, uh, of the insects that have been attributed to spreading the disease. And I, I do not 
know my insect uh, general well enough to be able to even pronounce their general uh, their, uh, correctly, so I'm not going to. But just to know that it is insect vectored and it is through these sharp sh sharpshooters and leaf hoppers. What you tend to get with this is more of this marginal kind of leaf um, necrosis. It's often irregular with on, on the leaves. It usually has a yellow to reddish band between that um, brown and green tissue, like I mentioned. And the symptoms are seen in mid to late summer. Uh, these are just examples of it on an on a, um, oak. There's an elm example here. In the bottom, it's a sycamore, and then another oak uh, sample in the lower right. Uh, it can affect a large number of, of different species of deciduous trees from red maples here, American elms, um, Chinese elms, sycamores or London plane trees, red mulberries, dogwoods, peaches, plums, sweet gums, oaks, all kind of species of oak. Um, so pretty much you're listing almost every deciduous tree that we have. Uh, the other one I wanted to mention was actually yellow or tulip poplar. And in many of the research um, or some of the sites you can find, or information you can find online, will actually mention this yellow poplar as being resistant. And what we've actually been able to find is that this is a yellow poplar, um, this tulip poplar outside of the, on the UGA campus, that does have bacterial leaf scorch. It's consistently tested positive for bacterial leaf scorch. We just haven't been able to get the bacterium out of it to be able to, um, to prove pathogen on the tree. But you can see in this like one branch that starts showing these symptoms of the scorching and the dieback. Uh, sort of a up close picture of it is you're seeing some of the scorching developing and we just see a lot more yellowing associated on these um, on this yellow poplar with this disease. But we have not been able to confirm the um, Xylella as being the true pathogen because uh, we haven't been able to get it out of the tree. Um, it's a very slow growing bacterium and it's very difficult to actually work with. The, but these trees have tested positive on both PCR using a molecular means as well as also um, an ELISA test kit as well. What you get with bacterial leaf scorch is a slow decline. It often, um, of trees, it's drought stress and high temperature stress um, often increases symptom development because this is a vascular disease. It gets, in, the bacterium gets into the vascular tissue and the xylem tissue. So you're reducing the flow of water through that tree. So if you have drought stress or high temperature stress, it just exasperates the problem. Uh, this is it showing it on a sycamore um, and another picture of a sycamore up close where again you can see that yellowish border that's um, bordering in that scorch type of symptom. The symptoms initially affect um, individual branches and then eventually it's followed by the entire tree that will be, uh, become infected. And these are just some individual pictures. These are trees in um, the Athens, uh, Georgia area that um, the one oak tree is actually on the right hand side is showing sort of individual branch dieback and individual branches showing more symptom development than other branches. And then this other tree on the right hand or the left hand side, you can see it's this tree is the entire tree is showing scorched symptoms. The same tree species is right behind it and you can see that one is being is still all green. Um, it has not actually, this tree was infected. Uh, I took this picture probably about four to five years ago and the tree that's infected um, has been cut down, but the tree next to it has still not shown any symptoms. So one of the recommendations is to get rid of a tree that actually has the um, bacterial leaf scorch just to pre prevent its spread, but I'm not so sure it spreads as easily as we think it might, um, or that we, we suspected it might. So that's an, another area that actually needs some work, uh, research on, to determine how fast it might actually spread. I mentioned you start getting this branch by branch dieback, and over time, those individual branches that are affected, they just stop putting out leaves and they die until eventually the trees look so poor that you end up cutting them down because they look so unhealthy. So this was a, um, a sycamore on the right-hand side and an oak tree 
on the left, or sycamore on the left, and an oak tree on the right-hand side. And a lot of this damage, if you look, it's up in the upper canopy. There's not much translocation of water up through that canopy. A lot of times this symptom actually looks a lot like um, construction damage. And in fact, this parking lot behind here was built after the tree was here, started showing symptoms, which I am sure has probably increased that problem on the tree. When we start looking at bacterial leaf scorch management, I mentioned it is spread by leafhopper species. Controlling of the leafhoppers through insecticides has not actually been very effective, especially in tree studies. Um, there really is no cure for this disease, and these trees will die slowly um, until eventually they look so poor that you prob they'll probably be cut down or re and removed, or they die completely. Uh, this is just another oak tree showing some of the, um, of a willow oak that's showing some of the individual branches that are dying off. It's in the lower canopy as well as up here in the upper canopy. This picture was taken um, uh, probably about five years ago, and now the entire tree is completely brown at this time of the year, but the surrounding trees are still looking green and still starting to color up for the fall. Um, the only real control we have or management, kind of chemical management option we have is using some of these oxytetracycline injections. This is an antibiotic injection, and I just put two examples here, the Mycojet and the Bacostat, they um, will slow symptom expression, but they will not eliminate the bacterium from the tree. The other thing is that they have to be repeated annually. So in most cases, this is something that it would be used for trees that are high value, very um, specimen trees, trees that we do not wanna lose type of trees. Um, but for the average street tree, or a tree that, um, in this case, this is around a school, they're not gonna pay to actually do any kind of treatments on this tree, or for these trees. Uh, but oxytetracycline, the antibiotic, is a possibility, um, option to use. They're done as um, injections into the lower crown of the plant, into those root flares. Uh, and that most of these are now actually canisters that you make small holes in the tree and then insert the canister and kind of pop it. And that will and get release the antibiotic and it gets taken up by the tree. Um, but it is something that has to be done on an annual basis. One of the problems I am seeing is that um, I work a lot with tree nurseries and I am seeing bacterial leaf scorch in tree nurseries. So there is a possibility of trees being transplanted that may already have this disease. Um, so that's a concern um, and it's a concern for me as a uh, plant pathologist working with the nurseries and we're trying to figure out options of what to do. We just have so many kind of naturally occurring sycamores um, and out in our and, and oaks and things in our natural environment that even if the tree, if the nurseries basically plowed up and um, knocked down um, entire blocks of infected trees, they plant new ones, the leafhoppers would just move in from this, those um, surrounding wood, kind of woodlot areas and actually could spread the disease into the trees again. In those cases, that's where maybe insect management may help because it's one of our few options that we actually have. Um, I do want to mention there is another book that this group, our SNPM group uh, did develop. That's the Southern Nursery IPM Working Group. We've wrote, written a book a couple of years ago called IPM for Select Deciduous Trees in Southeastern Nursery um, Production. And this is a tr uh, book that you can get at this website. It is free. You can download individual chapters. So if you were particularly interested in oaks or maples or magnolias, there are chapters in there on those trees. And so it contains both insect and disease uh, inf and information as well as a section on weed management too. So this is just a resource for you to have. Um, I know in my write-up, I had mentioned about verticillium wilt, 
but I ended up deciding on time that I would take that out. And the main reason for that is, is we just do not see verticillium wilt developing here in more of the deep south. The only time I have ever found verticillium wilt here in Georgia was on a newly um, introduced B&B uh, &B tree that came from a more northern, northern tree nursery. And once it got here, we identified verticillium wilt, and then the tree was actually planted out, but the tree survived and has never really had a problem with verticillium wilt here. So I ended up, for time, I ended up taking that out. Okay. Um, so if you had any questions, I think I've hopefully left a little bit of time that, you could, um, that we can answer some. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Williams Woodward, for that excellent overview on leaf spot scorches and wilts affecting southeastern deciduous trees. So, everyone, um, uh, Jean, if you could stop sharing your slides, I will share mine again. Okay. okay. Can you see that, Jean? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, so, as I'm going over this last slide for all the participants, um, if, if anyone who's interested in asking our speaker a question, if you can type that please in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. That would be really helpful. That way I can keep up with all of them. Okay, so um, on this last slide here, Again, for those of you who joined a little bit later, our speaker was Dr. Jean Williams Woodward. She's with the University of Georgia and her email address is here if you had any questions you wanted to reach out to her. And today's webinar is being recorded and it's going to be archived or what listed as quote unquote on demand at forestrewwebinars. Excuse me, forestrewwebinars.net and that's how you got here. That's the that's the webinar portal. So if you want to refer this on to someone else or you'd like to watch it again, you can um, look on forestrewwebinars.net in the next few days. I should have it uploaded. So if not tomorrow, then Monday, it should be online. And uh, for those you might be referring this on to, you um, participants can still get ISA and SAF credits up to a year after today. So 12 minutes, 12 months after today. If you have any questions about the webinar series, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Holly Campbell. Here's my email address. Um, feel free to check out our website, which is where all the webinars in this entire series, there were 12 webinars. Uh, we had 11 of them because one of them was postponed. Um, they're all listed there with all of their links to the webinar portal, so you can watch those. Uh, to take our short satisfaction survey, which we hope all of you are able to go through, um, you'll go back or, I'm sorry, so to take the short satisfaction survey or to receive the ISA and SAF credits, um, you just want to go back to your open browser window for forestrywebinars.net and follow the steps in step two. So go through that process. Okay, so I'm going to field some of these questions for you. Uh, Dr. Williams Woodward. Okay, so I'm going to go down to one here that says, I transplanted a tulip tree sapling in my yard in the late winter of this year, and I think it may have gotten this bacterial leaf scorch in the early summer as it dropped all of its leaves by midsummer. However, the branches are still green and solid. They're not brittle or breaking off, off as, if, if it, as if it's dead. Do you think it will survive into next year? <laughs> the, um, so my general answer, answer for this is that when you've recently transplanted a tree, the, if, depending upon where you are, and I don't know where you are in the country for that, but depending upon where you are, a lot of times those trees may not have gotten established, especially if they were planted in late winter, early spring. They may not have developed enough root systems to really get established in that, in that site. And so what you may be seeing with the yellowing and kind of scorching and even leaf drop could be just attributed to like transplant stress. So with transplant stress for every kind of inch caliber of trunk of a tree, you can expect a year of, of kind of me saying it could be transplant stress. So um, I would wait and see how it is, especially how it comes out next year and what happens to it. And if again, you start seeing some of this uh, 
uh, yellowing or sort of scorching on some of the leaves in about starting in about midsummer to um, to late summer. Then I would probably get if you're concerned about it, I would get it uh, sampled to a plant disease clinic at one of the universities uh, to see if they could do some testing to see if it is bacterial leaf scorch. Great. So um, we only have one minute left, but I will I will go over one more question here. Okay, so, um, so as a quick summary for county agents with extension, um, should we not worry about anthracnose or oak leaf blister, treat shot hole and cherry and eliminate trees with oak wilt and BLS? Yes, so <laughs> the general take home message hopefully you get from this is that there's a leaf spot disease on every tree. And most of those leaf spots are not going to cause many problems at all. Oftentimes by the time you see the spots, it's way too late to treat for them anyway. And if it's a larger established tree, don't worry about it. Um, if you have the BLS or the, or the bacterial leaf scorch or something with the oak wilt, the most critical thing about that is get some identification and confirmation that that's what it is. Do that as quickly as possible. So like as soon as you start seeing symptoms, get a sample into a, a diagnostic laboratory and see if we can try to confirm what it is. Because if we can catch the symptoms and the progression of those diseases early, we might, we'll never eliminate it with treatment, but we might be able to suppress it and be able to extend the length of uh, the lifespan of that tree in that landscape. Okay, would you be interested in ask, answering one more question? Sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. So in this one, um, one participant, in Western Tennessee, the herbicide diacamba has become, a com has become a common application, but is terribly prone to drift. Are herbicides that have relatively common and volatile drift issues connected anyway to oak wilt? That's actually a good question. Herbicide, um, especially like for dicamba, and I've even seen um, some of the atrazine kind of problems on some of the trees too, is um, that they, they will exas um, exasperate or kind of increase um, symptom development and actually can stress the tree out. As far as an association of the dicamba use or herbicide use with like oak wilt, I don't know of really a connection to that. But anything that affects the ability of the plant to um, photosynthesize correctly, translocate water and nutrients correctly, then that's going to stress the foliage out and it's going to um, increase symptom development. But I don't think there's a direct relationship with herbicide injury and like an increase in plant diseases, especially like oak wilt. Great. All right, well, we are after uh, two o'clock here. So is there anything else you would like to say to our participants, Dr. Williams Woodward? No. Um, I Thank you all for coming and uh, are participating in this. I know there are people who do have questions. I saw some things pop up on the chat. If you do want to send me a mess email with the questions, I'll, I'll try to get those to you. Um, depending on how many emails I get, don't, I may not be able to get to you today, but I will try to answer those and get back to you with as soon as possible. Great. Well, thanks everyone so much for joining the webinar today and participating in our, in our last webinar of the series for 2018. And thanks again, Dr. Williams Woodward, for this excellent webinar. We really appreciate your participation. All right, everyone, have a great day.